Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know It All. I am in the car at the gym. Actually just went to uh, Safeway and bought some stuff for my mom. She's doing surgery pre-prep right now. So again, <laughs> send on your good thoughts. I'll be here for hopefully just until this weekend. Um, hopefully she will recover quickly. So anyway, um, so I don't know what's gonna happen in terms of videos the next couple days because her surgery is tomorrow. So we will see what happens with that. But anyway, I wanted to talk about a couple of things today. Number one was my experience driving this car yesterday with 11.4 two on the highway we had to drive south to savannah to drop off our son in savannah and to drive all the way back up so it was about 10 or 11 hours on the road it was a very long time and uh, all, pretty much all of it was on i-95 like like almost all of it and so i had a lot of chance to explore and if you if you're a twitter subscriber definitely check out my video that i did then i actually got in the middle of there was a huge very violent slowdown of traffic while i was doing the video and the car handled it exceptionally well uh anyway so i-95 absolutely terrible highway my least favorite interstate in the united states and yes i have favorites and least favorites interestingly enough my favorites tend to be the 10 and the 5 freeways, so I, I like those freeways a lot. Uh, interstates, I don't like 95 at all. Don't like 80 at all. Don't really like 90 very much because of the bad weather and stuff. Anyway, so whatever. But I wanted to talk about the fact that the, the steering wheel nag has gotten to over a minute now, generally speaking, with the weather being good at night is as much, much more rapid than that. Uh, I noticed that yesterday, but I was actually literally like using my watch to like stopwatch it. <laughs> it was going between one and two minutes and it was seemed to be approximately 15 second interval. So it would either be one minute, one minute 15, one minute 30, one minute 45, two minutes, something like that. So that's just an approximation, but I did it like 30 or 40 times. It was a lot of times that I did it. So I had a pretty decent sampling. And what I discovered from that was on the highway in the daytime, with you know good weather and all of that kind of stuff there is no reason why teslas could not seek regulatory approval to become level three autonomous so this is the you know mercedes made big waves because if you're going 40 miles an hour and you're in heavy traffic on a highway on a sunny day blah 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 then you can take your hands off the steering wheel well a tesla i will attest to the fact that on the highway driving in good conditions, no, you know, no construction, no rain, no nighttime, that kind of thing, that there is no reason in the world why the car cannot be level three autonomous at this point with this version of the software. And that is really astounding. It, it's just amazing to think that I could have driven most of yesterday with the car driving itself. The steering wheel nag was really unnecessary. It, it, it did it because, of course, it's required to do that, but there was no reason for it. Even with the incredibly violent slowdowns and terrible traffic and everything, the car handled it all fine without any problems. Now, you know, if there's an exit and all of that kind of stuff and going on city streets, then yeah, the, you know, the software is not as good at this point, but Tesla could seek regulatory approval on the highway under the correct conditions where the car looks around and goes like, yeah, it's a sunny day and everything's fine and everything's nice. So it could absolutely do that. Will Tesla actually apply for that? I, I actually don't think so. And the main reason why is because they're iterating their software so rapidly right now. It, it, every time you apply for regulatory approval, you would have to freeze your software for a period of time. So 11.4.2, for example, if they wanted to apply for that, uh, at least my understanding of this is, and I don't know this for sure because of course I'm not a regulatory expert, although my mother-in-law actually is. Man, does she know everything about highway traffic safety. Holy mackerel. <laughs> so anyway, I'll ask her about this just to be uh, very clear about that. But as far as I understand it, you would have to freeze the software and you would have to say like, this is the version that we request that you give us level three autonomy, you know, granted or whatever that is, that you grant us this approval. Well, the problem is by the time the six months or a year goes by, that software is way out of date and Tesla's just not going to want to do that. So I think that they're just not going to want to fight the fight. So instead, what they're going to do is kind of what they're doing right now with 11.4 versus 11.3 and previously was that the steering wheel nag used to be like 20 or 30 seconds apart and now it's like a minute to a minute and a half to two minutes and at night it is much faster it's more like the 20 or 30 second range again but as the conditions are good i think they're just going to dial down the amount of steering wheel nags you get so officially it's still hands on the steering wheel but it, it will eventually probably get to like five minutes or ten minutes between steering wheel nags and so it, it just won't be such a thing anymore so and Anyway, that's I, so. The brief story is, 
they could absolutely do it. My experience yesterday on a, on a gnarly, gnarly highway was that there is no reason why Tesla cannot be level three autonomous at this point. And remember, in the levels, level three is in the middle. That's where you don't have to have your hands on the wheel or pay attention to the road, but the car can say, hey, in 30 seconds, an exit's coming up, or I see a construction zone coming up. Hey, pay attention. You should probably take the wheel again. That kind of a thing. So you would still have to sit in the driver's seat and take over under circumstances, but it would give you warning it wouldn't be like instantaneously take over now it would be like hey in 30 seconds or a minute please take over so it'd like beep 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 something like that it would warn you about that kind of a thing so abs could it do it absolutely will tesla seek that regulatory approval probably not just because of the fact that it would be complicated and they would have to freeze their software Okay, the second part of this video is on Grace Hopper. <laughs> so this is the new NVIDIA hotness, the new, uh, it's a whole system on a chip now. So it, it's a CPU slash GPU. It it's, looks like an absolutely beastly machine learning type of a uh, piece of hardware, a piece of kit, and of course, NVIDIA's stock is just hockey stick that's straight up in the air. I really wish I'd invested in them a couple of years ago. Damn, I'm stupid. Uh, anyway, so, um, um, but but everyone is like, oh crap, NVIDIA is going to run away with this. They are going to, if somebody doesn't catch up relatively quickly, they're going to just become the hardware manufacturer and they'll basically have a monopoly on AI hardware, uh, machine learning type hardware. So I would like to point out, and many people have talked about counters to this, but nobody has really, really pointed out the ecosystem that Tesla is developing. So they've got, people talked about Dojo to some extent, and that is absolutely going to be if it works. And Elon has said, you know, what did he say? High stakes, high reward, I think something like that. But multi, multi tens of billions of dollars if this works. If Dojo works, it's going to be a major competitor to server farms with NVIDIA GPU slash now CPUs in them. And that's something that's a very, very powerful competition. And Dojo, as opposed to NVIDIA for all they, they've done and everything, I was actually just looking at a thing, um, I don't know, it was, it was something by ARK Invest. But anyway, that, you know, even 10 years ago, NVIDIA was a gaming company. Even maybe five or six years ago, NVIDIA was a gaming company. It made GPUs for games. It wasn't a machine learning behemoth, but it's pivoted to do that. But part of the problem is that their entire sort of background is creating gaming GPUs, and they are very, very useful for machine learning, but they're not identical to machine learning. So machine learning has some different needs and things like that. And that's where a, a piece of hardware like Dojo and stuff like Google's uh, TPUs and things like that, that's where those come in. Those are specifically designed for machine learning types of situations. And so they have higher memory throughput things. One of the big problems with machine learning is memory throughput. It's not so much the compute cycles, although obviously that's a big deal, but when you have to take these gigantic multi tens of gigabyte models and you have to shove them into these things and then you know go through them run through all your training sets and you also have to take your petabytes of data run it through there you'd mash that stuff all together you do all your calculations then you have to sift through that redo all the weights and read it back to memory those things are very very inefficient and that's where a lot of the inefficiency comes from in terms of machine learning hardware at this point that's one of the things that something like dojo is designed very very <clears throat> heavily to compensate for with their very, very high bandwidth memory access to compute. And there's, there's other things too. There are, there are like doing calculations in memory, things like that. I, I watched, I think it was a Lex Friedman interview. It was really fascinating about, uh, gosh, and I'm forgetting the person who was talking about it. It's the guy who does the maker lab at MIT, but anyway, just amazing person. And he was talking about how, uh, you know, the people who design computers were wrong. They put compute and they put memory in separate places. And so one of the, one of the major things to consider is how to do calculations in memory so that you're not moving things back and forth between memory and compute. So that is another aspect of this. But at the very least, Dojo, as a, if, you know, if they can build this out and if it's a, as efficient as they want it to be, is going to be a reasonable competitor to NVIDIA and will hopefully reduce NVIDIA's potential to become more or less of a monopoly in this area. And that would be all to the good. I think competition is good for everybody. It's good, it's good for Tesla. I mean, right? It's good that there are these Chinese companies. It's good that Mobileye's out there on the on the hardware software front doing <clears throat> um, autonomous driving. It's good that Cruise and Waymo are out there, even though they take a very different approach 
research and they aren't as good. Competition keeps people on their toes. <clears throat> if there's no competition, you just get lazy and <laughs> just do whatever you want. So, so competition is good. So I'm not saying that I have anything to say bad against NVIDIA. They have just, it's an unbelievable company and they've performed amazingly well. But don't forget about Dojo as a competitor. But then here's the other thing that nobody seems to be talking about, which is the little beastie that's sitting over here under my glove box or behind my glove box, which is hardware three or obviously hardware four, <clears throat> which is uh, starting to be deployed in vehicles now, which is nobody knows exactly what the specs of hardware four are right now, but it should be substantially better than hardware three. But these are built as inference engines, but they are machine learning engines. They are built from the ground up to be machine learning, very, very high performance machine learning engines. They're more on the, the lines of inferring things in other words in real time taking the model that already was trained on a system like dojo and uh, implementing it inferring what's going on in the real world rather than doing training you could of course do training on them there's no reason why you couldn't it just wouldn't be as efficient because they don't have the memory or compute resources to do that but they are mobile along the lines of like an nvidia grace hopper uh, chip and I don't want to compare them too closely because I don't know the specs of Grace Hopper that well And I don't know the specs of hardware 4 very well at all because nobody knows those uh, But but anyway, you know, you, you can see a parallel between these things. These are systems on chips They do very very high-end work and on a very specific type of task and that allows, that means that what Tesla has is not just the, the big server farm training facilities, but they also have the, effectively the edge computing. They have the, the mobile, right, the laptop with the GPU in it. So they have both ends of this. They can compete effectively with NVIDIA on both ends of the scale on terms of the big giant server farms and also on the inference engines. Now, the fact that they're putting this all in their own data servers right now and in their own cars right now means that they're not going to be competing in the near term on the mass market with NVIDIA, but Elon has very specifically said that the car, uh, the, the car, the Dojo very well, if it works, could be licensed out as servers as a service. So it could be the kind of thing where eventually, hopefully researchers will be able to access it. You'll be able to buy time on those machines, sort of like AWS. AWS, of course, being an entry point to NVIDIA GPUs on the back end and CPUs and things like that. But I'm just saying like, you know, it's kind of a, it's just a front. It's a storefront to that. But I think that this is all to the good to actually think about how Tesla is not just a software company. They're not just a car company, but they're also fully integrated into the capability to be able to compete with a company like NVIDIA on the, on the AI machine learning hardware front, both on the very high end for really exceptionally fast training, but also on the portable end for inference engines. And that is really, really amazing stuff. And then of course, uh, to circle back to the beginning again, you've got full self-driving being what I would really call fully level three on the highway under proper conditions. That means that these things are already doing a real world job. And if you don't think that that's important and you don't think that that's a milestone, this was really the first time driving 11, even 11.3 11 on the highway. I was like, eh, you know, it needs help sometimes. Uh, but this, this was just no questions asked. It was able to handle it. Even during some of these really, really violent slowdowns, it didn't like cry for me. It didn't go like, you know, please hold the wheel and tell me you're still there. It was perfectly capable of handling those situations. Are there still problems? Yes. The biggest problem is that the follow distance is too long between you and the car in front of you. So if you're in the passing lane, the car, uh, a lot of times cars will come up on the slow lane and get in front of you and, and just because they're annoyed because you're not as close. Now, of course, was it safer? Of course it was safer because the car was further behind so that when there's these drastic slowdowns, the car has more room for error to be able to slow down, which is better, not just for the Tesla, because I think the Tesla can slow down. It can slam the brakes on really hard, but it's the guy behind you you always have to worry about. That's the thing. And there was one time yesterday where this guy, like, he got mad at me. I don't know why, but I had to slow down quickly because there's a line of traffic stopped in front Front and that guy almost hit me in the back and I had to kind of veer off the road and then he got mad at me and I was like, I didn't, I didn't do anything. I had to slow down. There was traffic in front of me. But anyway, so I'm not worried about the Tesla being able to stop because it's got very, very fast reactions, but it's always the guy behind you. So the ability for the car to slow down at a stately pace so that it's not putting the guy behind you in quite as much uh, angst would be a good thing. But it does need to kind of adjust that follow position so that it's not following too far away, which encourages people to go 
slow lane into the fast lane and to get in front of you, which is very annoying. People really don't like that. So anyway, that's it's something to work on. It's a very complicated balancing act. This won't be a problem when everybody's driving autonomous vehicles because of course cars will just behave themselves then, but it's human nature to be like, oh, I see more than a car length in front, so I'm gonna like squeeze in there. Uh, so while that's going on and while we have to deal with human beings and the nature of human beings, then the car is going to have to drive in a little bit more aggressive manner, at least in assertive mode. So anyway, that being said, I, I'm just, I really love the fact that I see Tesla as being one of the primary future competitors to NVIDIA. And again, not that I have anything against NVIDIA. I think the company is amazing. I think their products are amazing, but competition is good. And it will be really good to see Tesla fighting in that arena, uh, even right now. I mean, they've deployed millions of these hardware three and soon to be hardware four chips. And hopefully Dojo is, is cruising along right now and doing a fantastic job. And in the meantime, congratulations to the Tesla hardware team and to the software full self-driving team because you guys are absolutely killing it. I'm totally loving driving full self-driving 11.4.2 and I can't wait for the next version. In the meantime, everybody have a lovely day. And again, if you have time, send thoughts and prayers for my mom for her surgery. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.